right guys, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whenever you're looking at this video. Um, so today we're going to be discussing um, the document-based question that I want you guys to do this week or this weekend. Um, it, it's centered on content that we've already learned. Um, it's specifically about um, Catholicism and uh, how it was accepted or not accepted in most of the American areas. Um, so we're going to look at what this is asking us to do, what it's requiring of us to do. So first thing, we're going to respond to the prompt with a historically defensible thesis or claim that establishes a line of reasoning. Things that we've already been doing pretty much the whole entire year. We're also going to describe the broader historical context relevant to the prompt. We've been talking about this all year. We'll go over that as well. We're going to support an argument in response to the prompt using at least six of these documents. There are seven documents. Six of them go perfectly together. There is one that's kind of an outlier that we can kind of kick to the side, or if you're feeling strong, you can try to incorporate that document as well. Uh, we're going to use at least one additional piece of specific historical evidence beyond what's in the documents relevant to the argument um, that's it, about the prompt. So we're going to see all of these things happening. We're going to bring them all together. Let's see. The second to last thing we're going to say for at least three of the documents, we're going to explain how or why the document's point of view, purpose, historical situation, and our audience is relevant to the argument. So we've been talking about bias. We call it bias. They say how does a per person's point of view shift their, uh, their, their purpose and their historical situation? How's that going to shift them and turn them into or turn the document into an untrustworthy document or to a trustworthy document. And finally, we're going to use evidence to corroborate, qualify, or modify an argument that addresses the prompt. Things that we've been doing for pretty much the whole entire year. All right, so I'm going to go over each and one of these documents to make sure that you guys know what is going on. This document or this DBQ can be found in your AP College Board website. Um, I'm going to have a link for that included underneath this video as soon as we finish. So document one, first thing we're going to look at is the source. We're looking at the time period between 1500 and 1800. We have a 300 year time period. So the first document happens in 1592. All right. We're going to see that there is going to be a confession by a Brazilian man, an African Brazilian man, excuse me, a European American Indian Brazilian man, excuse me. And we're going to see how that's going to correlate to the extent to which Christianity was accepted or not accepted um, in, <clears throat> in, uh, in the Americas. So um, with Mr. Nombre, we look at our document. We can see that he's going to confess to being a heathen and he's going to confess to running from missionaries, basically running into uh, the wilderness to avoid being converted into, uh, in, converted into Christianity. Um, we're going to see that there's going to be a large area where indigenous religion still reigns and the natives are being persecuted for not converting to Christianity. So we see him confessing after he's been caught about what he's been doing in the past during the past few years. And we can see how Christianity is being preached, it's being forced upon a lot of the American or the, the mestizo Americans who were there. But unfortunately or fortunately, they're not really accepting of that uh, religion. So if we scroll on down to document two. It's going to be right here. All right, the source of that is going to be Philippe Guzman. All right, he's going to be a Christian who's the sense of Inca nobles. And we're going to see how he's going to illustrate what's going to happen um, during the 1500 to 1800 time period, specifically in the year of 1615. So we can see that on the one on the left, this is going to be the original indigenous religious forms. So we can see it's called the, uh, where is it? Vara Viracocha Runa and the Vara Viracocha Oana. Those are going to be the mythical indigenous figure figures that are going to be celebrated or followed um, specifically in the in, in, uh, it, Indic region, excuse me. Um, and then we're going to see that over here, a few years later, we're going to see the acceptance or the bringing in of Adam and Eve into this indigenous culture. So we can see here that they're going to take in 
the Christian gods and the idols, but they're still going to practice some of their own indigenous beliefs as well, just based on the art form that we can see there. So once again, that extent, to what extent are they fully accepting Christianity? Are they being resistant to Christianity? What are they doing? And we can see in this one that they're kind of com combining their beliefs with those Christian beliefs. All right, so here, document three, we have a Catholic priest who has written a manuscript for other Catholic priests who are going to be working with Amer Indians um, in, in Mexico around 1656. So he's basically saying that a lot of these priests, they were trying to, cheat, to teach um, admirably, trying to teach very, very hard um, to convert a lot of the um, native people of Christianity, but it was not very successful because they were still finding ways to um, praise or follow their own gods and their own um, idols. Um, so we can see, let's see. He talks specifically about how the rural native groups, those who were further away from European dominance and European control, they were able to, they adopted some of the Christian ways, but they still combined those ancestral traditions with those Christian rituals. Um, so we can see they're still having sacrifices, they're still using animals, they're still using things like that, that Christianity kind of frowns, frowns upon. So we can see even in document three, are they fully accepting Christianity? Are they fully accepting what's happening and what's going on? And it looks like if they're in areas that are fully European or dominated with Europeans, they're more Catholic or more Christian than if they're in rural areas that are kind of separate or away from that European dominance. All right, so document number four. This one's kind of interesting. I think this guy's kind of a snitch. Um, he is a Native American person named DeVargas. This is gonna be in 1703. And so even though he is of uh, the Native tradition, the of the Native ethnicity, he is gonna kind of turn against them and tell about what's happening and what's going on. Um, so he basically says, yes, you know, they are still sacrificing animals. Um, and the way that they're able to cover it up is that after they sacrifice an animal, they will go to an area and they, they will go to a Christian church, praise that Christian church. They will use the feathers from one of those animals that they slaughtered and they'll prey upon that feather. Um, and the same person who was just slaughtering that animal is now going to be in church and that person is going to be praising um, Jesus and God and those idols. And so it was their way of kind of hiding um, and covering up what they were doing. And we're also going to see that they also use a lot of guards. They would have people stationed in strategic positions that would let them know if a Spanish person or some kind of suspicious outsider um, was coming to report them and tell um, what, what they were doing. Um, so we can see that once again, to the extent, how involved were they? How accepting were they of Christianity fully? We can see that they're not completely going to accept it, but they're going to once again combine what they're used to doing with what they have just learned and find a way to mix those two together. All right, document number five. All right, this is going to be a testimony from one of the Spanish captains, um, excuse me, one of the Portuguese captains um, who is investigating or who is testifying against um, a freed Angolan uh, African woman. And it just talks about how a lot of the people in the area go to her if they want to get treatment. And when they want to get treatment, um, there is people fall out. People are screaming around. She's standing over people. Um, it seems very much like she's practicing voodoo. Um, and many of the townspeople are coming to her and running towards her for treatment instead of running towards the Christian churches. So when we think about that, this is talking about the African side, those people who were enslaved and brought into um, the Americas. There's even resistance in those groups to uh, Christianity and Catholicism. So we see that there are, once again, what is the extent that European, that, uh, that Amer Indians and that uh, newly freed or newly enslaved people are accepting Christianity? They're not. They are really resistant of it, and people are actually seeking them out and trying to find them um, instead of just going to the Christian traditions. All right, so document number six is probably one of the more interesting ones. 
and one that you guys could probably kick out or take away from your essay. So we see St. Benedict. St. Benedict is holding a baby Jesus. Um, St. Benedict is going to be from a, uh, it's a church called the Church of Our Lady of the Rosary of the Black People. That's going to be in Brazil. This is going to be a group of freed slaves um, who are very, very embracing of Christianity and Catholicism. We can tell that they embrace it because we have a black saint right here who is holding on to a white Jesus. Um, so we've learned previously in the year that what you do your art about is how you feel and how you believe. So we can see that this is built by these ins or these newly freed uh, Africans or uh, Brazilian Africans. And so they're embracing Christianity by um, doing modeling their art after a young baby Jesus that's being held by one of the black saints. So that tells you to this extent, in this document at least, Christianity is being embraced and accepted um, by the African people that are in Brazil. So this document, I would say, is the one outlying document. It's the one that if you don't feel comfortable including or you can't figure out a way to include it, you could probably exclude it. Okay? So now we're going to go on to our final document, document number seven. All right, so we have a visiting religious scholar or diplomat, um, whatever you want to call it from Spain, um, named Felix de Arzara. Um, he's, basi he's basically investigating one of the native-run Catholic churches. This is going to be a church that... Uh, the Catholic priests are going to educate some uh, native scholars. Hopefully those scholars can then turn around and educate their own people about Catholicism and things like that. So we can see in this document that he says, hey, they are going to be baptized. They're going to know all their Christian prayers. But deep down inside, we know this isn't really true. Um, we know that they have a hard time. We have a hard time truly translating um, the Spanish or the Latin text into a language that these people will understand. And even when they do actually try um, to have people who are from this native language um, speak to the people, they realize that they don't know what they're saying and they're kind of just making up things along the way. So it's not very successful. It appears successful from the outside looking in because all of the students who go to the school, all the priests, they all know the proper Catholic uh, uh, hymns. They all know the prayers. They have all been baptized. But if you dig a little bit deeper and a little bit further, you can see that this is kind of just a facade and it's not really true because they don't have a real way of translating um, the text into languages the native people understand. Um, we learned this previously with Martin Luther. He was really big on educating um, educating the, the Germanic people um, in, in Christian scholar, in, in Christian text, excuse me. And the way he did that was by translating the Bible into different languages. So they were not able to adequately translate the Bible, which means that communication was frayed. It wasn't as strong as it could be, which means that the acceptance of the religion cannot be as strong. So once again, were they fully accepting or what extent is Christianity changing society? It's changing them on the outside. But if we look deeper inside, the people are truly not accepting or fully understanding what Christianity is. Now, if we look at how things are today, we can say that that's definitely different. A lot of people who are of African descent or of Latin American descent, they are very much embracing of Christianity, of Catholicism, of things like that. Um, but during the early time periods, it was definitely a fight. And if it was not a fight, it was a combination of those European ideals with those African and Native ideals. All right. So now we're going to talk about what the thesis is going to look like um, for this question. So once again, we're talking about the extent to which Christianity is going to change societies. All right. The extent to which Christianity changed societies in Latin America in the period of 1500 to 1800. So we have to remember to answer the question fully. We have to remember to restate the question completely. All right. So I will say... Look at the question one more time. It says, explain the extent to which Christianity changed societies in Latin America from 1500 to 1800. From 1500 to 1800, the Spanish and Portuguese used Christianity as an imperialistic tool to control many territorial regions in the Americas. But they were not able to fully convert the people 
or have them abandon their indigenous tra tra uh, traditions. Catholicism appeared to be stronger where there were larger concentrations of Europeans, but in areas with the biggest concentration of either indigenous or African people, African people's religion was at best a combination of religious traditions. So we're going to say that one more time from 1500. I cannot read off my phone because it's clear on my phone. I can't do that because I'm using my phone to record. From 1500 to 1800, the Spanish used Christianity as an imperialistic tool to control many territorial regions in the Americas, but they were not able to fully convert the people or have them abandon their indig indigenous traditions. Next sentence. Catholicism appeared to be stronger where there were larger concentrations of Europeans, but in areas with the biggest concentrations of either indigenous or African peoples, their religion was at best a combination of religious traditions. Once again, that mixing of European uh, Christianity along with their own indig indigenous traditions. Um, we talked about this previously. We can see that even now today in our own churches. Um, if you go to a black or brown church versus a European American church, European American churches are known for being a little bit more quiet, a little bit more subdued. If you go to a black or brown church, you might see people dancing, screaming, hooping and hollering, making music. The preacher is going to be loud, very demonstrative, really extra. That's going to be that combination of our traditions with Christianity. Um, so I think that's pretty much it for this video right now. There will be plenty more of these coming. Um, so I need you guys to work on this essay. It is due by Sunday um, so that Graber and I have a chance to look at it, evaluate it, and review it for our class that we're going to have on Wednesday. Um, have a great rest of your day, your morning, your evening, whatever it is. And I look forward to seeing you guys next week in class.